My guest today is John Skeet. John, how are you, sir? Very well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. You know, it's really crowded here in Chicago. The the marathon was ah. yesterday, and tens of thousands of people just showed up in my neighborhood. <laughs> but they're leaving now. <laughs> right. I didn't invite them. Uh, what's new? It's been a while since I've talked to you, my friend. It's been far too long. I Agreed. think the last time we really chatted was when you were over in London and we went to see a, a production at the theater. Oh, that was good fun. I need to do that again. Good fun, yes. Yes. Which is not a million miles away from what we're likely to be talking about today. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah. What are, we, what are we going to talk about? So, uh, when when folks ask me, so what, what have you been thinking about a lot? Um, as you did, I tend to talk about what I've been doing in my spare time, and that's, quotes spare time, uh, basically since the start of the pandemic, which is I've been spending a lot of time working on the AV system for my local Methodist church. Um, so I'm a Methodist local preacher, so I do go around from church to church and preach, uh, but I'm also involved in the leadership of my local Methodist church. Mm -hmm. And I think it's probably worth setting some context um, because churches really vary across continents. I mean, even within the UK, there are many different sizes of church. Uh, but on a Sunday morning, uh, our congregation is typically around 80, let's say. So when I have been looking at various videos you know, with recommendations, they will talk about, well, your sound team will want to do this and your video team will want to do that and the band will want to do that. And it sounds like there are as many people in the kind of church that this video is uh, envisioning as we have in our entire congregation. So <laughs> <laughs> really, uh, when it comes to tech stuff, it's going to be one person doing things, and that really changes changes the game. Um, yeah. So I realise I've sort of skipped forward a little bit uh, in terms of what we'll be talking about, but I, I wanted to set that, con that context that we're talking about small churches from a US perspective, and actually within Methodism in the UK, a, a church that gets 80 members of the congregation on a Sunday morning is doing pretty well. There are lots oh, of... Oh, same thing here. Ones. Right. Especially now. That... <laughs> right. Yes. It's, it's a difficult time. We, we do have mega churches uh, right. that have rock and roll bands. You can see them on television, but I, I, I don't go to those. I go to my small Roman Catholic right. church. And I think it's... that's uh, that sort of mega church is what a lot of the videos around AV things are really aimed at. Oh, yeah. Um, they're, they're really polished shows. I've, yeah. I've seen recordings of them. Yeah. Um, so, shall we rewind back to March 2020? Oh, do we have to? Oh, uh, <laughs> I view this as a kind of silver lining. We, okay. We have we have seen good things, if I say come out of the pandemic, um, progress through the pandemic. Uh, and this isn't in any way to try to minimise all the many, many bad sides, obviously. Right. Um, but March 2020, all our churches in our Methodist circuit went into lockdown. You know, the, the country, the UK was in lockdown. Yeah, so dear. we could not meet physically. Mm -hmm. Many churches immediately hopped on Zoom. Uh, we took about three weeks to do so, which at the time for me was very frustrating. It, it's not like our minister was sitting idly by or anything. He was really, really busy with pastoral concerns because as you can imagine, a load of the congregation members were going, I don't know what's going on. I, you know, there was a lot of help that needed to be given, and it was difficult to do that because of the lockdowns, etc. Sure. Um, luckily, luckily, they had a computer guy. <laughs> well, so so the the computer side was not really happening yet. Uh, our first Zoom service was on Easter Day in 2020. In fact, so there were oh probably uh, the most weeks. popular service of the year. Uh, indeed, um, and there was a, a certain interesting there are there are theological things you can bring out in terms of new life and and things although we were very much it was grim it was in lockdown etc but at least we could then see each other online yeah. um so for that first service our minister ran everything so he queued up videos of worship songs and and various things and would do the zoom spotlighting thing so uh i don't know if you how familiar you are with Zoom, but for anyone who's not, um, 
Zoom has a screen, a screen share feature, as you can mm -hmm. imagine, which can include audio and also has spotlighting. So normally in Zoom, either you see a sort of mosaic of everyone mm -hmm. or you see a film strip of some people and whoever is speaking gets the limelight, as it were. Right. Well, the spotlight feature allows whoever, whoever you want to to be the person that everyone sees big, as it were. Uh, so it doesn't matter if, if someone else chips in or coughs or something, it doesn't switch back over to them. So it made sense that if someone's doing a reading, someone's leading a prayer, the spotlight would switch over. Sure. Um, or other, the, we would switch over the spotlight to them so that they can um, be the, if I say them be the focus of attention, what they're doing be the focus of attention. Right. Um, I should probably interject here that well, this this whole conversation will be interrelated with my faith, but I'm not trying to convert anyone, just in case anyone's sort of thinking, oh no, this is going to be a, an evangelism thing. I might make you think better of the church than maybe you think at the moment, but we'll, <laughs> we'll see. Um, I think you, I will say that you do a good job of leading by example rather than preaching at people. You, you've set a, a good example of what a good Christian should say. be. <laughs> That, that's what I would like to be the case. Um, yeah, I'll let others judge. If you're, if you're, if you're trying to do that, you're succeeding. Right, great. So back to this first Easter Sunday service. It was lovely service, great to see everyone. But if you've used Zoom to do screen sharing, you know that there are a bunch of clicks to do. If you're going to share your screen, say, yes, I want audio, confirm which screen, then press play on the video player, then make it full screen so that we don't get to see the play button, etc. A That's lot of a steps. Lot of yeah. And all the while you've got a hundred people or however many waiting and watching. And I know from experience, it feels terrible. You feel under so much pressure. So Andy was trying to do this as well as preaching, leading the service, etc. And you would never normally try to do all of those things at the same time leading a service um, you wouldn't sort of rush around and play the organ and then rush out and <laughs> read a reading and then rush over and etc so i said okay why don't you lead the service and i will do the sort of i like to think of it as the directing side i'll, I'll organize all the tech things so the second week that's what happened andy led the, the worship um i clicked on the spotlights and things and had all the videos queued up so it was fairly a little bit more seamless but it was still a lot of clicking and then I idly looked and said I wonder if zoom has an SDK and I found it did and I thought well if I could automate all this clicking away then it can happen in the blink of an eye hmm. so this is how the first application called zoom and enhance started off um, with the, the name being a, a reference to all those TV shows where they've got a, a CCTV camera and they say, right, zoom and enhance, and suddenly <laughs> this is the best camera in the world. Um, so zoom and enhance is purely aimed at zoom and it lets you have a load of videos um, in a list and a load of people that you want to spotlight. And if you want to spotlight someone, you just double click on their name. It mutes everyone else removes the spotlight if there is one from someone else, stops anything, that, any videos that are playing, switches the spotlight over, etc. Likewise, mm -hmm. if you double click on a video, it stops any current spotlight, starts the screen share, starts the video, and it's all just one click and happens much quicker. So mm -hmm. you just get a, a smoother experience. Very nice. Um, and I guess that's the first point that I'm going to be making repeatedly, which is the whole point of everything I've been working on. I've been putting a lot of effort into the technology not being seen at all. Right. Uh, every little bit, if you're going from a wonderful sermon into singing a, a joyous hymn, the last thing you want is a five second pause and then someone says, oh, hang on, yeah, it won't be a minute, it's just coming. <laughs> it's that friction point and you yeah. just want to, just want, people to forget that they're using Zoom at all and just be able to worship. So that was Zoom and Enhance and it, it progressed over time as you can imagine. Um, in fact I think the first version that I used, I said I, I looked for the SDK after that first service that I'd done all the clicking. Uh, so that was on the Sunday afternoon and by the following Sunday I 
got a very alpha version ready and sort of said, well, should we go with this? It might all fall apart. Oh, why not? Let's let's give it a try. So that was a very rapid turnaround for ah. a really... You know, none of this is pretty, partly because I'm a terrible UI designer. Um, <laughs> but you're testing in production. I, absolutely. Very, very much testing in production. Um, and it improved over time, and some other churches took it, and um, that, was, that was all fine, but this was only about Zoom. Obviously, happily, our churches have been able to reopen, and I don't know about in the US, but in the UK, it was a sort of gradual process, and one of the difficult things was not knowing how that process would happen, um, because you've got a lot of work to do for planning for how you're going to manage this and without knowing what you're planning for it's really hard to do that planning but i kind of imagined okay currently no one's in the church building then there'll be a stage at which maybe 10 or 20 percent are in the church building and everyone else is still on zoom that's what, that's um, what my church and, did right and that that they required you to register actually before right. showing up in order to limit Attendance. And then you've got social distancing and there's only so many people you can fit in when you're two metres apart or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then there'll be a period where it's maybe 50% that there are fewer restrictions, but quite a few people are still shielding, un uncomfortable with being amongst many people. And then an 80 to 90% of people in the building and 10 to 20% who, for whatever reason, are unable, unwilling to be in the church building. Um, so that, those are the sort of milestones that I had imagined. And as it happens, through good fortune rather than good judgment, as it were, that's how it did happen. Um, one of the important aspects being from April 2020, when we were still completely on Zoom, and I really hadn't thought about what hybrid church would look like yet. Um, and when I say hybrid church, I mean some people in the church building other people on Zoom, mm -hmm. um, and all of this is the church. It's not some people in church and other people on Zoom. It's the whole church, some of whom are in the building and some on Zoom. Sure. Uh, it's a really important thing to me that the church is the community of people. The building is just somewhere that's convenient to meet. Um, so from April 2020, I was thinking, while I am physically able to make this happen, I want to stop us from letting down people who can't get there get to the building physically because it's not like people became uh it's not like before the pandemic no one was ever housebound or no one was ever ill or looking after an ill child or on holiday or all of these reasons why you might not be able to get to a church building but would still like to participate in the worship um so i regarded this as okay this is a wake-up call for the church has been letting down the community for centuries um now, only within like the, the last decade or so before the pandemic could there have been anything to do about that, uh, but we should stop that letting down as soon as we can. And you know, I, I wanted sure. to maintain... This um, the pandemic uh, created a good excuse to address this issue, right. uh, maybe because it affected more people. There. And it showed people who might otherwise... No, I'll revise that. Who would otherwise have said, if you'd asked a load of people in 2019... Um, would you ever consider worshipping remotely using a computer or a phone? They just said, no, that, that would be terrible, wouldn't do anything for me, wouldn't be worship. And then when that was all they had, you accept it right? You know, reluctantly. And I'm sure most people would say, yeah, it's, it's not the same. I would rather be together in person, but it's absolutely better than nothing. And I can still yeah. worship. It's, it's, it's graceful degradation. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, so I started planning for that, started doing the planning the second half of uh, 2020, started looking into cameras and things. So uh, pan tilt zoom cameras that we would mount at one place and then you could spin them around and move them up and down and, and zoom in so that you weren't just limited to, well, there's one place in the church that you could see or three places in the church building that you could see. Um, so I started looking at those and thought, gosh, they're all very expensive. Um, and I had a bit of a deadline for, I had to get something working by December, 2020, I think it was when 
um, a couple of my friends were getting married in the church building that was permitted with a very, very small number of um, attendees, etc. And I wanted to be able to stream the video on Zoom and record it for them for posterity. Right. Um, so I needed to get something working by then, but that was still, I hadn't yet really started putting together the pieces of the next step, which would turn into what's called Zoom, uh, at your service. Um, the next application. But I've been thinking, well, before the pandemic, we had an audio mixer, an analog audio mixer, and a computer with a program called Zionworks on it that was used to project hymn words onto the screen. Mm. So it sounds kind of simple. There's an audio mixer and something that we only used for hymns and sometimes readings. So it wasn't the whole time. Um, and it was it was kind of clunky, but it was, it worked. But the audio mixer was, uh, I think it was an Alan Heath something, perfectly good audio mixer, but it had about 150 knobs and buttons because audio mixers do. This was 14 channel, I think. Um, so it's not like it was a vast, really, really expensive state of the art mixer, but analog mixers, by the time you've got even 14 channels, and sort of three pass um, EQ and panning and the fader and mute and sound effects and things, you end up with a lot of knobs and buttons that most people in our church were never going to use because we would basically mute and unmute and move the faders, the, the little slider things up mm -hmm. and down. And everyone found it intimidating. So we, sure. couldn't, get, we couldn't get enough people to run the AV desk before the pandemic with just the mixer and the computer. If you then start saying, oh, by the way, you've also got to control Zoom. So start the Zoom meeting at the start, make sure you mute people, etc. Oh, and you also need to move cameras around. <laughs> that was not going to fly. It's a lot to ask somebody. <laughs> yeah, particularly you know, someone like me might enjoy doing that, even if it's complicated, but most, most of the congregation, well, most of the congregation is never going to be on the AV desk, but if you need to have enough people to be able to put put together an AV rotor so that it's not always me on the AV desk, then things need to be simpler. And also, sure. if things are simpler to start with, then you know, even those who can manage more complexity, it's not like we want to have the complexity. All things being equal, simpler is better. Exactly. Um, but that should be simpler in terms of the user experience, not that we were trying deliberately making things more complex in terms of functionality by introducing Zoom yeah. and the camera. Um, so I sort of started thinking, how can this work? Yeah, that's, and... the, that's the uh, keep it simple skeet, the KISS principle. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> nice. Nice. So as you can imagine, I started looking into digital audio mixers. All right, let's get rid of this big audio mixer from the from the desk let's have something that doesn't have any knobs and buttons on or maybe you know a power switch and maybe a headphone control um but other than that it's purely sockets and plugs to put the um audio cables into and crucially a network connection so that you can control the thing over the network mm -hmm. um network or usb would have been fine in fact where we ended up was both so audio goes over the usb connection and it's all controlled by Ethernet. Right. And likewise, the camera was, I looked into, well, how could we control a camera over the internet? Because a lot of the pan tilt zoom cameras, they come with their own software. They come with, you can buy hardware to sort of move a little joystick around, etc. But I wanted to make it so that we could have one system where everything was controlled so that much like in Zoom and Enhance, where double click on the video and it does everything needed to show the video. It should only be the click there, not me thinking, oh, I've got to move the camera and do this and do that and do umpteen things. So I was restricted to only using equipment that I would be able to control from a program um, and control over the network or USB. So no extra physical hardware involved and no proprietary protocols or, or if there's a protocol then there's got to be an SDK for it right. um, and 
of course, I, I did look to see whether there was off-the-shelf stuff that, that would handle this, because actually, our church's requirements, I want to be able to switch microphones on and off, I want to be able to show Zoom, I want to be able to show if someone's doing a reading and they happen to be at home, we should be able to show Zoom within the church building. Um, I want to be able to move cameras around to presets and change those presets. Do any of those requirements sound actually unusual? No, not a, they don't even sound church specific. No, they're not. They're not very church specific. Oh, and I need to be able to show him words and things, and that's a yeah. little bit church specific. Yeah, there but... are words that you could show for other things. That could be yeah. a user group uh, could use right. that technology as well. Absolutely, or a conference. Absolutely. So there's relatively little that's really, really um, church specific. But I could not find there are there are loads of systems for designed for churches. But nothing, I'm not even sure that I saw anything that would control a digital audio mixer. Partly, there, there's no one standard for digital audio mixers. Mm. There are loads of protocols, some of which are well documented, most of which are entirely undocumented. Um, and in fact, I, I've got a blog series that I have made very little progress in terms of writing <laughs> the blog posts, but quite a lot of progress in terms of implementing the code um, to say, the idea of a digital audio mixer, there's a certain sort of lowest common denominator, denominator in terms of I want to be able to mute things, uh, I want to have input channels and output channels and control the volume. This sounds like a good topic for explaining encapsulation and running across what are the limitations of encapsulation? How could we, how do we cope with differences between systems? So that's my excuse for buying quite a few digital audio mixers. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm looking at a couple of uh, racks in my shed, which is my home office, um, and I have, yeah, far more digital mixers than I could really justify um, any other way. But it's <laughs> when I eventually write the blog series, it'll be great. Um, <laughs> That's a, then the that spare time issue kicks in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so I did look for off-the-shelf things, but there was nothing that would even just control the mixer and display song words, let alone also control Zoom and also control um, the, the cameras. So or... you built one. So I built one, yeah. Um, it was possibly a foolish endeavor, uh, <laughs> but it turns out to have been highly satisfying. Um, so from, from a faith perspective, I this sounds pretentious, but I genuinely felt a calling. This was something where I, I have skills that I can contribute to the church in a way that hadn't really occurred to me before. Um, I had enough time because my kids are a bit older and during the pandemic, at least initially, there was loads of time because all the meetings that I would normally have been in were canceled. So yeah. you know, I had more time to, to put into this. Um, and so I started building it, then expanded it with some interesting features uh, because when you've got your own system, adding a a new feature or area of features is relatively straightforward. Um, so you can control lights that are available via a protocol called DMX. Um, so in our Pentecost service this year, um, which has uh, for, for those uh, who aren't aware, so Pentecost is when Christians celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit and the reading that's always used talks about the Holy Spirit appearing as if the, the apostles um, had flames on top of their heads. And so obviously you've got uh, some lights that are battery powered and wireless, which is a great combination, um, wirelessly controlled. Um, and so they're, they're going red and orange on the, uh, on the face of the person doing the reading. Wait, uh, what? My church yeah. does nothing like that. It's never done that. And, and it's, <laughs> It's actually fairly easy to do. What was less easy to do, but also uh, a, it was partly a project that a another church that might take at your service, the, the system, um, wanted because they've got Iranian refugees. And partly, well, when they'd said it, there was no way I was not going to implement it. They said, we've got some members of our church who would love to be able to access the material in their own language. Uh, does your system happen to do real-time audio transcription and translation? I said, uh, no, it doesn't. You said not yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Um, so then I you know, found a real-time audio transcription service, put things into Google Cloud Translate, um, and so now... And now they get it in Farsi. Uh, yeah, you can. So the idea is it the, the system runs a little web service, um, web server rather, so you can um, connect from your phone as a member of the congregation and see the, the sermon being transcribed in whatever languages have been configured um, and, and just read it along with a five, ten second delay. Uh, and I don't know the quality of the translation or the transcription necessarily, but even so, it's a pretty, pretty amazing thing. And I demonstrated yeah. that at, uh, at my local church where we don't actually have it generally enabled um, because we don't have members of the congregation who would use that. Um, but it was, again, a, a fun feature to demonstrate on Pentecost where, again, for folks who are speaking in tongues. Familiar, yeah, so <laughs> at Pentecost, everyone heard the apostles in their own language. And it's like, oh, this is very just cool. a, a perfect, perfect <laughs> tie-in. Um, so it's been immensely... As you, as you can tell from my enthusiasm, it's been so much fun to do. I've learnt huge, huge amounts. Um, and it's useful to the church. It's useful for podcasts like this. And I've given user group talks and conference talks, um, spreading my enthusiasm for hobby projects. And yeah, it's, it's generally just been so positive an experience for me. Very cool. What, uh, what was the biggest challenge, do you think, in terms of technology? Hmm. It sort of depends on what you mean by in terms of technology. So what was I the think that, oh yeah, so just to remove that part of it then. What was the biggest challenge? <laughs> so I think the biggest challenge is you've got all these moving parts. How do uh -huh. you present it so that it is as easy as possible to turn up, uh, to mm. to operate? Um and from the very beginning I realized that we would have people with different levels of tech experience yeah. so for example you need to prepare the service beforehand to make sure you've got the right hymns loaded up um the right camera presets etc etc yeah there's no um, way to avoid that complexity you right have to do some setup. but that doesn't have to be the person who is sitting at the desk on the sunday morning good point so i i wanted to separate out those service edi editing parts where you're presenting lots of different options most of which will be irrelevant in any given service and could be overwhelming. Well, I can do that from home, upload the service to Google Cloud Storage, and then whoever is on the AV desk on the Sunday morning can sit down, do synchronize, fetch the service down, and then they can run it without knowing, they may not know how to edit the service, um, but they know how to present it at the time. And likewise, even those on my team who do know how to edit services probably wouldn't know how to do the lighting bits and pieces because we use those so rarely. Mm. And it's sort of, okay, how can we make this so that any given user has everything they need and nothing else? Right. And as it, someone who isn't a UI designer, that was my biggest <laughs> challenge. Oh, I see. <laughs> now, you mentioned that the other churches are using this. What, what, what do they have to do? Like, like if somebody's listening to this now and they say, boy, I want right. that for my church, uh, what, what's, what has to so happen? So currently there are, no, there are no live users. I've got two churches who are definitely interested. Okay. And as ever with a volunteer-run thing, it's a case of finding time and everyone's busy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there are two other churches locally who are currently starting to think about an AV revamp. Like, we know our AV kit it needs replacing, renovating, whatever, um, and I will be involved in consulting. What do you need? If at your service is part of that, great. If not, also great. Uh, but I can at least give the benefits of my experiences of doing this to say, have you thought about X? Have you thought about Y? You know, it's good to get the, the physical mixers um, out of the system. I didn't mention, actually, two... Um, to other devices that, that we do use, um, which is again, part of the user experience, but particularly for people who aren't as comfortable with keyboard and mouse. Have you come across a stream deck at all? Stream, I know what stream is and I know what deck is. Right, okay, so a stream deck is a bunch, I mean, I can show you, I don't know whether we're recording the video or not, um, but oh, this we, is- We are, yes, it's, uh, right. so it's a piece so of hardware. 
this is a Stream Deck XL, I see. and it's uh, four rows of eight buttons, basically. Mm. But each of those buttons is also a little screen. Um, and so this is one way that you can, if you're not that comfortable with keyboard and mouse, you can do most of what you need using the Stream Deck mm. because you get the top two rows will show in quite small text because they're small buttons, um, the names of the, what I call scenes, uh, which might be uh, you know, show the preacher or hymn one and then the name of the hymn, etc., etc. And then you press that button and then everything happens. hymn words come across the bottom so you, you can move things around. The fact that each button is a screen means you can respond dynamically to that. So that's one other kind of interesting user interface. And the other, um, apologies for the sound of Velcro um, there, is what's called an X-Touch Mini. So I mentioned before 150 knobs and buttons. Well, that's far too many, but this is something with one fader, um, a couple of buttons over here that I don't use, then 16 buttons that have lights on and are good for indicating muted or non-muted, and some um, knobs up, up at the top that, that you can twist around and sort of give a, a volume indication. So some, although the previous mixer that was massively uh, over specced was really intimidating, being able to just hit a button quickly oh, yeah. rather than, oh, I'll, I need to get to the right tab and then find the mute bit of the right thing, having something that you can glance at to see what's live and also mute quickly um, has been really, really useful. So it's very much been a case of, well, where does some extra hardware make sense versus far too intimidating hardware? Sure, there's a balance here, flexibility versus simplicity. Yeah. And of course, all of, both of those are completely software controlled. So yeah. even though the X-Touch Mini is a Behringer piece of kit, um, it doesn't know what it's talking to at all. Uh, it, it isn't talking to the mixer. It's talking to my software that controls, uh, that, that knows to send things to the mixer. No. Um, and if you mute or unmute in the software you know, on Windows, then the light will go on and off on the um, X-Touch Mini as well, and you know, vice oh, versa, nice. because yeah. they, they just don't know about, uh, there's no direct connection, it's all sort of indirect. Nice, uh, so it sounds like it's it's not to the point where it's like the church AV in a box, there's still some setup, they still have to call John uh, for was, some uh, yes. so device the along things... the way, which doesn't scale quite yeah, okay. absolutely does not scale. <laughs> um, if I if I retire, I would love to put the time into the various aspects that would be tricky about open sourcing this. Um, I would love to eventually give me ten years to retire, and and we'll see. Um, but apart from that, at the moment, one of the reasons that it's not easy to just say, "Oh, go ahead and do it." Um, things that are one time setup or only occasional setup of someone of admin ability, they're all just JSON files or saying, well, you need to set up a Google Cloud Storage bucket um, or the translation key or whatever it is. There's no GUI for configuring, well, I've got three cameras rather than two and here are the IP addresses. They're just in a JSON file. Right. Um, I can write documentation for that JSON file. At the moment, I'm still trying to finish the, the documentation, and I can share with you later on a link for the, the user guide for um, the main software itself. Oh, yes, please share that, that. That doesn't include configuration things, because partly, if I say it's unstable, I mean, I change bits of the configuration um, all the time, mostly as it grows. There are relatively few backwardly incompatible changes that I need to tell everyone, right, upgrade your version, etc. Um, but yes, it... Again, it's come from, it does what we need to do. And I didn't need a GUI to configure things. <laughs> so it's, right. um, yeah, it's a, a mixed blessing being your own set of users. I know that it meets our needs really well and is fine tuned to those. Um, but yes, it means it doesn't immediately scale to a thousand churches. Uh, oh, did you do this all yourself or did you have some folks helping you? Uh, so, so far all the code is written by myself. Um, it's in a private GitHub repo. Um, as I say, it can't quite be open sourced yet for reasons I won't go into. Uh, but just this morning, I was setting up a friend of mine within the church who also happens to be a C-sharp developer. 
because um, this is all written in C-sharp using WPF. And uh, I gave him a feature request today. Uh, yesterday we had, uh, I wasn't present in church yesterday um, because I was at a youth conference. Um, not that I'm claiming to be a member of youth, I was there as, as a leader you know, <laughs> looking after the, the kids. You're younger us, than so. me. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a, a, a fabulous time and I learned to load anyway. Um, you know, I, I derived more value than, than I gave, I'm sure. Um, but so I, I wasn't around, I wasn't running anything, um, but got a, a message saying, oh, the mixer's disconnected. And it turned out that someone had unplugged the mixer. <laughs> um, so there was no power from the mixer, no network connection, etc. Um, and we did have a, a, a warning, well, an error message on a status bar, but clearly that wasn't in your face enough to attract attention sufficiently before the service. So the feature request that I've set to my friend is, when there's an error, can you make it flash instead of just going red? Uh -huh. um, and I, I tend to find things like that Sometimes they'll turn out to be really, really straightforward. Sometimes not. I'm, I'm guessing this will be less straightforward than it sounds. Everything is. But we'll see. <laughs> well, but sometimes things just drop out. The number of features, and I don't know. I've sort of anal analysed my myself in terms of how I've how I've thought about things while I've been building it. Um, and got a whole other conference talk out of that in terms of I, I know now that I have different modes. I can have a clean up mode or a bug fixing mode or a feature mode or just exploring things mode where I'm not going to none of the code is going to make it into production. Mm. Um, and I know not to mix those modes because otherwise the commit history ends up being a mess, etc. Right. Um, but I don't know what it is about the architecture exactly that has enabled new features to be added easily, but it's worked really, really well. Oh, so yeah. I, I remember having an email um, from someone saying, could could you change it so that we could see in the camera presets buttons which preset the camera is currently pointing at, if it's pointing at a preset at all? And I sort of said, oh, well, that's slightly tricky because the camera only reports kind of roughly where it's pointing at. It, mm. Or it might report precisely, but when you say go to this value, it goes to near that value before stopping. Um, mm, well, I'll see. But quarter of an hour later, um, I think it was actually 13 minutes later, I replied to him with a screenshot of, right, this is it's now working. Um, nice. so, so sometimes things are actually much easier than you expect them to be. Uh, okay. I'll just <laughs> I'll state David's law, which is, Almost always, things are take longer than you expect them to. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I do certainly find that things that shouldn't take much time are the ones that do take time. <laughs> so in that particular feature, um, trying to because I was changing the color of the button, trying uh, trying to find a way of accessing. Well, what's the default color of the button? Because that's what I want the color to be when it's not the preset mm. that a camera is pointing at. Um, that was probably 90% of the time of implementing the feature. <laughs> That's ridiculous. I'm pretty sure my answer in the end was to set it to something that I could retrieve. Oh, I see. So it was your default. Close to the default one. Just it. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear that WPF is still alive. <laughs> it's, I've really, really enjoyed working with WPF. And as one of the challenges I set myself, um, I'm very aware that there are loads of MVVM frameworks out there, right. but hey, if you're going to do a project like this, take the time to learn as you're going along. So I thought, well, I won't use any frameworks out there. I can learn some of the features that they have and see, you know, build them into my own very mini framework. So I have a model base that allows me to just call set property and it will raise I pro notify property changed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but by building all the code myself. I've got a better idea of how it works. This is not encouraging people to reinvent the wheel all the time, um, but it meant that I had a better understanding of how WPF worked. If I were doing a commercial application with WPF, I suspect I would use one of the off-the-shelf frameworks that has been tried and tested um, and probably need would probably need more functionality than my little version provides. Um, but it's it's really useful to have done things kind of from scratch. 
Well, that sounds really awesome. And then I hope that even though I'm a Roman Catholic, I hope that next time I'm in the UK, I can attend a service at your church. Oh, that would, be, that would be wonderful. It really, really would. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. This has been great entertaining and information. <laughs> My pleasure. Great to see you again. Sometimes technology can bring friends together, and sometimes friends want to come together and technology helps that, but you actually want the technology to get out of the way. Either way, technology and friends work together.